All right. <clears throat> uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. I, um, I go by my full name, Brian David Crane. And the reason for that is, uh, as you can hear in my accent, I'm, uh, I'm American. Um, I grew up in the South in Tennessee. And people in the South have a hard time spelling Brian. So they would spell it brain, and it would be brain crane <coughs> all the time growing up. Educated folks from all over the place would do the same thing. So I find if I went by my full name, it was uh, enough of a speed bump, and um, that's why. So a bit about me. Let's see. Trigger. There we go. Um, and why am I talking about uh, the hidden downsides to being a, a digital nomad? So the first time I lived abroad, I studied abroad in Argentina. Um, I did a year. Uh, what was originally six months was so awesome that I dropped out of school, spent another six. Um, I owned a, a recycling firm. I'd started with my mom at the, uh, um, when I was in high school. And um, I came back after the, the year abroad in Argentina, graduated college and, uh, and sold that company. And at the time, <clears throat> had some money, um, had read maybe the four-hour work week like a lot of people in here. And, uh, and decided I was going to do uh, a trip around the world. I was going to do a trip called what I was, what I was calling 25 at 25. Um, and I got three countries into it and, uh, and canceled it um, for a couple reasons. The biggest one being that uh, I found it really neurotic to have um, no purpose. I found it really neurotic to just be like kind of flitting around traveling for a year. And I, when I looked at the year, I wasn't particularly enjoying it. So I came back and... Um, Ended up going belly up anyways uh, in the 08 financial crisis. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Got my teeth kicked in financially um, and wound up taking a job out in Silicon Valley. I got mentored. Um, I learned how to launch digital brands, digital businesses. Have you know helped launch now um, five different multi-million dollar brands. Probably the best one is archives.com. It was acquired by ancestry.com for 100 million cash two years after launch um, and I became nomadic again in uh, 2014 so to date lived on four continents and I've traveled over 40 countries and um, and the reason I'm giving the talk today is I think there's I think there's some sacred cows when it comes to the digital nomad movement that are um, that are maybe misrepresented. Um, and this is based on personal experience and also some, some data um, from, from folks who are much smarter than I am. So let's get started, huh? Okay, so the sex appeal, right? Work from anywhere on your own terms. Be independent, find a better work-life balance. How many people in the room are like, believe either one of these two things, right? I do, right? I think it's awesome, right? You see the pictures. Now, when I look at this picture, this is this one I ripped, um, is kind of a typical uh, selling point for being a digital nomad. Number one, I look at it and I'm like, you're not gonna be able to see the computer screen. It's gonna be hard, right? <laughs> Number two is horrible ergonomics, right? If you've ever tried to work at one of these lounge chair type kitchen, I don't even know what to call this thing. It's gonna be, um, it's gonna be hard on your shoulders, hard on your elbows. It's gonna be noisy here. Who knows how good the Wi-Fi is, but it looks sexy, right? And people are like, boom, they like it on Facebook, they like it on Instagram, and they think it looks awesome. So. What are the trends driving um, being a digital nomad? Because there's some big ones, and I think they're interesting as far as why we all wind up in Bali um, and are trying to make this work. So you have first one, you have massively improved internet access. This is a picture of a shark trying to eat an undersea telecom cable in Vietnam. It took him years to figure this out, to get him to quit doing this, right? Wi-Fi access has improved dramatically, even in remote regions. This is something that um, Facebook, Google, SpaceX or Elon Musk, they're all trying to get at this. Facebook for their own reasons because they want to have more people uh, using Facebook. Um, you know, but you have things like weather balloons that they're using to, to, uh, to spread internet access. You have satellites that are being launched. That's part of what SpaceX is doing. Um, it, anecdotally here in Bali, I've had friends who've been here since 2013, 2014. Ubud used to be the only place in all of Ubud that actually had high-speed internet, right? In the past two years alone, it's gone from um, roughly two megs up and down, if you were lucky to find it and it was unreliable, to having 20 megabytes with fiber optic almost everywhere on the island, right? You can get it installed at your villa, 
the internet's gotten better. So Bali is an example of like all of a sudden it's become way more accessible to be here. The one percent are flexing their muscle. How many of y'all are working for a company but doing it remotely? Okay, got it. So that's it's it's interesting because the top one percent, the people who have the skills that are the most in demand, a lot of times they're engineers, um, have figured out that they can make some pretty high demands on their employers. Right? They can basically be like, I want to work wherever I want. I want to do it on my own schedule. I work better at night. I work better in the morning. I work better with my toes in the sand, whatever it is, right? And you've had some companies come along, TopTal is probably the most famous, that have made this possible, that are like talent agents for the top 1%. 10X Management's another one in the Bay Area. Um, so this 1% is like, they're making this possible, right? Whoops. Then you have the changing work values. So millennials are placing a higher priority on flexible professional lifestyle and person, personally meaningful work. This is a net result of living during peacetime, right? So all of a sudden you're like, cool, what is you know, the intrinsic values that I want out of work? 86%, and this is a UN study, um, say that they're looking for something that's interesting. That's most important. 88% of them also report they want a positive culture. Like if you go back and ask your parents or ask your grandparents, they just wanted a steady paycheck, right? Or they wanted to know that when the lights, like that they could pay their rent or that the lights would come on or they could put a roof over their children's head. So all of a sudden you're dealing with like a whole different set of values where, where also stuff, contract work makes, makes sense to people. Like working for Uber, working for, you know, TaskRabbit, these sort of, um, these things that in, in theory give you more flexibility, but in reality lack a lot of stability, right? Okay, your degree is worth less than it used to be. This is since 1988, this is in the US, but this is the percentage of people who have a college degree, right? So all of a sudden you have this asset, it's going down in value, you spend a tremendous amount of money to get a degree or you've financed it and taken out student debt. You're dealing with a depreciating asset. So all of a sudden you have two choices. One choice is you go get more credentialed, you go get a PhD, you go get a doctorate, you become a lawyer, you know, some, some, something that requires even more credentials or you start to look for skills, but skills that aren't necessarily taught in college, right? I have so many friends who graduated with psychology degrees. It was the most popular major at uh, the University of Tennessee where I went. And it's, it's a lagging indicator. And what I mean by that is that like, if you look at the most valuable resource by century, 18th century would have been agrarian. It was those who controlled the land, right? They were the power holders. 19th was industrial. If you owned the factory or you were the bank, you had, you had, the, uh, um, you had the power. 20th century was a credential century, right? If you were a doctor, it created a tremendous amount of um, uh, prestige, esteem, and it was also hard to get. Nowadays, we live in a world of washing people who are credentialed, so it's skills. So it's skills. And these are harder to find, the highly skilled. That's why the 1% are being able to drive some of this stuff. Okay, again, another trend. world's much safer post-Cold War, right? If you look at the stats, life expectancy, this is worldwide up 9%, literacy, literacy is up 13%, poverty is down 74%, homicides are down 60%. This is according to the World Health Organization and UNESCO. So it's all of a sudden it's a lot easier to travel, right? You can go to Cambodia, you can go to Vietnam, you can go to crazy places that your parents would be like, I told my dad I was going to Vietnam. He was, I mean, he was in the Vietnam War. He was like, he had zero interest to go in there. Zero interest, didn't even appeal to him, right? And we have a totally different paradigm of what's, what's accessible and where we can go. Okay, US dollar strength thinks it's true even if you're, if you're in euros or pounds or something. This is an example of a currency chart from 2013 to 2017, four years, right? If you're going to Mexico, it got 60% cheaper. 60% cheaper coming with dollars. It's insane. Okay, so then we get to the question, is being digital nomad one of three things? a viable career lifestyle, a subsidized holiday, or a relatively high risk gamble? All right, that's, that's the question. I think it comes down to three factors which put you into this one if this is where you want to be and it not being a subsidized holiday or a very high risk career gamble. First one is, what's your plan? Did you blow up your life back home and are now figuring it out from the road? How many people know people like that who are like, had a relationship, had a job, had something happen to them, a cataclysmic life event. They're now out on the road and they're trying to make a startup work, right? They have no money coming in or very little money coming in 
and they're trying to get you, a lot of times they're life coaches, right? I'm not a life coach, okay? If anybody in the room is, apologies, but it's a sacred cow that I would say, like, they're like, they want to tell you how to, <laughs> you're laughing. I hope it's because you're a life coach. No? Okay. <laughs> um, so let's say like, if you're play, like, did you blow up your, ah, oh, shoot. Um, uh, did you blow up your life back home and are now figuring it out? Or did you already create location independent income before leaving, right? Are your skills in demand? How many people are graphic designers? I mean, it's a heart. <laughs> graphic, I mean, graphic design or they want to do website design or something that's like, I can say from personal experience, having hired graphic designers, having hired a lot of this stuff, the top 1% for UX is totally worth the money. 99% of it, you can find, you can go to lower cost locations like Thailand, like Indonesia, where they have tremendous design talent and spend six to $8 an hour on somebody who coming from San Francisco would be a hundred to $150 an hour, right? So this that's kind of right, but not really. But yeah, that's, that's the, the number the numbers are wrong or the paradigms wrong. It's, it's what people usually believe, but if you look a bit into the market, it's, it's not really like that. But that's the first impression, definitely. And yeah, like the UX definitely leads. And if you're like high position, but there's a lot of middle ground that I think you don't have to be in the UX and just do websites and make a really good living. Okay. So it's kind of starting to catch up with programming. I would say as far as I see, but. Are you doing it freelance or you got your own company? I'm doing it freelance. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I can and you're making it work? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I got to the higher percent, but I also spent a lot of time in the middle. So that's what I'm saying. Like it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> Respect. Respect. Um, I think I still, I still stand by this point of like, are your skills in demand? Or are you world class at something? Right. I think it's, uh, um, and if you're not, to a large degree, it's going to be very hard to be a sustainable digital nomad to make it actually last longer than a couple months. And I think the third part is, do you have self-discipline? Are you capable of saying no to bright, shiny objects? Are you able to maintain routines? This is the this one is probably the hardest because it's something that when everybody else on a Tuesday is like, let's go to the wherever, let's go to Changu and go surfing, right? And you have to sit there and go. I actually have to get this work done, right? Because I owe it to the client or I owe it to whatever I'm working on that I have to say no to these sort of things. Um, and it's a paradox, and I'm gonna get to it in another slide, of being a digital nomad. So there was a Harvard study done, and it was actually here in Hubud, um, where this professor came, Beth uh, Altringer, and she interviewed over a thousand uh, people coming through Hubud, and she did it anonymously. They had them submit surveys to find out how much money are they making, how long have they been going at this. It's a fascinating uh, study. What she found was the most successful nomads in our research have in-demand skills and have proven themselves already, right? This is not a, this is not their first rodeo. So, the trouble spots, the title of the talk. <laughs> okay, first one is we go back to the uh, um, the concept of self-discipline. And there's an awesome concept called plate discipline, which comes from the Dominican Republic. So what plate discipline is, is if you're in the Dominican Republic and you want to get off the island, you're a baseball player, you want to get off the island, the best way, actually the only way to do it is you got to learn how to hit every pitch. You got to learn how to hit pitches that are at your head, at your ankles, all over the place, the strike zone, right? It's what you do when you're starting out and you're hustling. You gotta take every opportunity comes at you. Now, these guys who get off the island in the Dominican Republic, they wind up in, in the majors and their batting coach goes, don't swing at that pitch, it was out of the strike zone. Don't swing at that pitch, it was a garbage pitch, it's a curveball. you gotta learn plate discipline. A lot of them burn out in the major leagues. Like a lot of digital nomads burn out. They burn out in the major leagues because they have to learn a totally different set of self-discipline, which is to say no, to the bright shiny objects, to the pitch that they used to be able to hit in the Dominican Republic because they're dealing with a whole new set of, um, they're dealing with better pitchers and they're also dealing with the concept of they gotta learn how to stand there and let pitches go by, right? They have to be more discerning. And I think as a digital nomad, the concept of self-discipline is something that's underestimated and is also not talked about very much because it's not very sexy. It's not very sexy. So, and if I'm trying to sell people and I'm not, but if I'm a life coach, let's say, and I'm like, it's amazing being a digital nomad, da, 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 like all I'm gonna do is focus on the upsides. All I'm gonna do is focus on the positives. And I'm not gonna tell people 
it takes a lot of self-discipline and it's a different type of self-discipline than it took to get out of the office or get out of the nine to five or out of the 40 hour work week. Cause that one's, that one's actually easier. You've got something you're working away from, right? So you have the concept of freedom, but inside of freedom, you have freedom from and freedom to. So freedom from is like, I don't want to be in an office. I don't want a boss. I want to, you know, I want to be on the beach. It's very clear what you're moving away from. When you get the freedom to, all of a sudden, it's like you've got a blank canvas and you have to figure out what it is you want to paint on it. And it's harder to do. Okay, lack of mentorship. You don't get ongoing in-person mentorship. There's value in being around someone whom you want to emulate. And I think with digital nomads and their constant travel schedule, they don't have the opportunity to find the right mentor and spend enough time with him or her. This is one of my mentors, John. He was a runner, of all things. So I got to running. And particularly, I don't love long distance running, but it was something that he was into. And I learned by osmosis, or I learned from just being around the guy, right? Like you emulate certain stuff. And I think one of the downsides is if you're moving around is you don't get the in-person mentorship. And there's a difference with mentorship and teachers. Mentorship is something that like you take on how the person sees the world, how they show up, how they act, their tone of voice, all these hundred thousand different social cues that go, um, that kind of go unspoken, that don't come across in a Zoom call, don't come across in an email, they're harder to pick up in person versus somebody who has a skill you want to learn, right? There's people who I might say, to go back to the Dominican Republic example, I want to learn how to hit a baseball like these guys from the DR, but they have a train wreck of a relationship or they're financially in trouble, right? Or they don't know how to be able to do X, Y, or Z. Shoot, I got to work on this trigger thing better. So, but it takes time being around somebody to figure out, is this somebody who I just want to learn a particular skill from or do I want to emulate them? Is this a mentor? And when you don't get that opportunity when you're moving around. Okay, envy and perceptions. Bring back up this guy. I'm going to beat up on him for a little bit. If I'm this guy's employer and I see this picture, I think to myself, number one, he's drinking on the job. Number two is his horrible ergonomics. He's going to be slouched over like this in about five minutes. Number three is he can't really see the computer screen. He's wearing glasses. He's outside. Like, who knows what's going on? Um, and then I have to deal with, if I'm an employee and I work with this guy, I look at this and I go, this guy gets to work remotely. What's up? I'm envious of him, right? If I, I'll go back to the employer because I, I own a company. So like as an employer, and, and our team's remote, just give some context. Um, as an employer, I start to doubt their work product. I'm like, is this the best this guy can do? Because if I see him working somewhere like that, I start to think, huh, huh, is he just mailing it in, right? Looks pretty nice. Is this guy just mailing it in? And I think the message here is that just because you're in paradise doesn't mean your work day is any shorter. How many of y'all are working more here than you were back in your home countries, time-wise? I am. Yeah. I am, if you're honest about it. Because it's, it's, it's just the reality of it. If you want to make it long-term, you have to do it. You know, you have to... What's does it track it or does it seem more? Because that's also interesting. A lot of times, yeah. It seems more because you have the people going to train. You're like, oh, I gotta work. But do you, did you like actually track physical hours? Because it, it seems like you work more, but I, I track them, and it's just, it kind of was an illusion because you have more cool stuff going on. So I'm just curious if you. Yeah, in my in my experience, I actually, um, I'm working about the same as I would be if I was in the states, let's say, but my per unit output here is less. So it's like I sacrifice, I'm more productive of them in the States, right? Um, and I, you know, I have a great work setup. I've got, you know, ergonomic keyboard, second monitor, a whole bunch of stuff. At the end of the day, like it just, I think it's, I think it's lower. Yeah. Yeah, I do personally. Okay. Lack of sustainable momentum. This guy, Gary Vaynerchuk is big on this one. And he talks a lot about, does it, does, is being a nomad, does it give you the chance to become so good that the market can't ignore you? And one of Vaynerchuk's big things is it doesn't matter where you're from, what your native language is, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status. He's like, the market is the bitch. It's the one that tells you whether or not you're good enough. And it constantly is telling you whether or not you're good enough. And I think... If you don't have sustainable momentum, you're never going to get to the part where they can't ignore you because you're so good, right? They can ignore you because you're on social media telling you, telling folks how awesome your life is, 
which is a, there's envy in there, or there's maybe some like some some things you run the threat of. But to be to be admired for your work is very hard if you don't have the sustainable momentum, right? Okay, road fatigue. I think personally, I think this is this is when I meet people who are doing like two to three weeks in a place. The amount of time needed to ramp up and ramp down in a location is underestimated, like seriously underestimated. There's a high cost of constantly planning travel <coughs> and work and basic living, and you deal with things that are unknowns. I don't care how good a place is reviewed on Airbnb, is that when you get there and you start to sleep, you find out the mattress isn't as hard as you like, or it's not as dark, or there's road noise, or there's roosters going off at six in the morning that nobody mentioned in a, in a review previous to that. And all of a sudden, or you deal with like that guy that I was showing you where he has horrible ergonomics. You're like, yeah, there is a work table you can use. And yeah, there is internet, but it's not that good for you, right? It's not that good for you. And so you start looking at the next place or you have to move around while you're there. Like I have friends coming in and out of Bali. They spend so much time looking for a place to live. Then they spend so much time looking for a place to work from. And if you're not close to Hubud right now in July and August, traffic is horrible right now horrible so you have to live almost within walking distance right like if you're up on the main on the main road it's a parking lot between two in the afternoon to six o'clock at night so if you even on a scooter it's going to take you 20 30 minutes i live up in peniston on which is why most of y'all never seen me before because like i'm up kind of near alchemy and to get here even today it's going to take me 30 minutes right so that's a that's a sunk cost that's a sunk cost as far as time goes and it's and it's and it deals or contributes to road fatigue. Lack of stability, I already talked about this. Your routines are constantly in flux and changing. I think it's stressful being without a home base. I also think it's hard on your body, but I do think it's stressful without a home base. And I think this is something that it creates a bit of neuroses in people that they don't wanna talk about. I, I deal with it. If I'm not sure where I'm gonna be a month from now, it causes me to not start not sleeping as well. I start to deal with like, okay, what's coming next? Puts me on edge. Okay, this is one that I think is not talked about very often because you're dealing with um, meeting a ton of new people, right? And all of a sudden you're like, is it business or is it a friendship? And it's a mixed bag of motives and especially in a, in a co-working space because you're dealing with people who you have no idea how much money they're making. So are, this, are they pitching you on something? Are they being friends with you because they view you as a client? What is, what is the relationship dynamic? And it takes time to get to the point where you figure out what's actually going on with them. In the interim, you have to say no to them a lot of times, right? Like I've had people come to me who are like, I want to work together, da, da, da. I have to say no. And I say no, even in the sense of not making a referral, because what I found personally is that a referral can create complications. Like all of a sudden you vouch for somebody else, their work product's not that good, or they're just whatever. Um, uh, the person that you that you introduce them to doesn't follow through, and you feel an obligation to step in and try to make things right. At least I do, right? So dealing with is it a business or a friendship um, can be can be problematic as a digital nomad because just the influx of people that you're that you're that you're meeting and you don't know what they're if they're hungry for money. So the solutions have a plan and reliable remote income before you jump. I think that's the biggest one. Um, personally, what I've found is staying put in one location with a regular routine for three to six months out of the year. I think you need to. I think you need to plant. Um, and then use that as a base to travel locally from. In other words, it's helpful to actually stop being nomadic and start thinking yourself as more of an expat. I think that's, I think that's the crux of it. I've used this now. I lived in Hong Kong, awesome base from which to jump off from, amazing airport, transportation systems. Um, I, I do, I've done this here in Bali. I've been in uh, Ubud since March of last year. Um, spent nine months out of year here last year. And I think when you do this, you find others who are also long-term expats, not necessarily temporary digital nomads. And it creates some staying power in that you have a community of people who are not just passing through, especially in a highly transient place like Ubud, right? So, okay. That's the gist of it. <laughs> uh, this is where I'm at online. What are your thoughts, questions? I'm monologued for quite a while, yeah. Sure. Um, 
some maybe most of the tournaments you see you play by yourself. Okay, you see people here, you make friendship here, but at the end of the day, after the dinner and you can everything else you go back to yourself. And especially if you leave your country because of the relationship with your family or friends back there, you can afford it. For sure. For sure. I deal with that. I deal with that. Yeah. There, and I, I mean, I deal with that. I think um, one, the only solution I've found is if you go back here and you meet other friends who are uh, long-term expats, um, I have been fortunate that I have a group of friends that are nomadic like I am, and we will see each other um, – you know, I'll see, I will see them again, right? Like I, I, I see some of the same people, probably a half a dozen friends um, every year, but in different locations. But the loneliness is a paradox of um, like the quest for independence. And what I mean by that is that as an American, like independence, blazing your own trail, it's something that's kind of in the national ethos. I know you're not American, but it's, 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 um, uh, is viewed as like something very much worth aspiring to. And when you become independent, it's incredibly lonely. And it's actually something that is um, uh, help for health health reasons. It's 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 long term damaging. It's long term damaging. And what they found is that like it's it's if you if you talk about somebody who wants to live to be a hundred, um, most people if you ask them would say they think it's genetics or they think it's lifestyle choices. And there's been some science come out recently that actually refutes both of those claims. So genetics being the easy one, which is it's up to the gods, the cards are already dealt, like, you know, so-and-so had cancer, whatnot, like I don't have to worry about it. Genetics is actually the third factor. It's the least important out of the three. The second one <clears throat> um, being lifestyle choices, sleep eight hours, deal with stress, those kind of things, those are important. But the first one is socialization. The first one is socialization. How many people you take care of and how many people care about you. And that takes in person, a lot of times, family, friends, seeing them on a regular basis. And I think it's, so there's downsides in the loneliness that are not, that are not particularly spoken about. Yeah, I mean, like, that's what, I think that's what we need Yeah. Always in the digital markets. There are always a few of loneliness. Yeah. Either at the end of the day or when we're getting back home or. Shared photos that I think is. It helps with the loneliness. So I think the solution would be to recruit. <laughs> why, why did you become a digital I was looking for a home. I was so looking you're, for you're a home. Kind of, kind of like you're the, I think there was more type of digital nomads on that. I definitely meet maybe your type was like looking for a place to settle down. So you're yeah. not traveling for travel's sake. It's more like, okay, can I sit here? Or, for sure. So kind of That's like, my case. Yeah. I might give a different view of everything. Like, it would be interesting to catalog what type of nomads there are. And then I think some experiences might be that well, I think I think I think the folks who are um, traveling uh, that there is a mistake that's made that there's a fair amount of people who are digital nomads who should actually just be on vacation. They literally should leave their computer at home and just go for two months and have a proper like reset period and then go back to SF or London or whatnot. Um, instead of trying to be in this gray area of working but not actually working and feeling guilty about it or trying to um, um, like not actually being on vacation right not actually being on vacation so but yeah you're right I mean there's there's, there's definitely there's different buckets there's different buckets what else considering that you're an employer and you understand both sides of Age, you know, yeah. Um, how do you handle it for your team? How do you motivate them? Keep them motivated, keep them on track. I know there's tools, yeah. management, but sometimes you feel lost. For sure. Um, 
I mean, as an employer, like we have uh, weekly calls, in per, you know, which I think helps to a certain degree. But um, uh, I will say that uh, as an employer, like we actually, I don't have a picture of it here in the stack, but our teams, I own two companies, both teams, the rest of the team is actually in an office together. I happen to be nomadic. And so I think that um, that, like, I understand, and we, I understand people who want to be nomadic, and I have no problem with it if they're um, self disciplined and able to, to maintain it. But to a large degree, I've found that um, from a project management standpoint, I would hire a group of people who are all in an office together as opposed to trying to keep everybody who's all nomadic moving at the same time. I think it's, it's, it's a part-time job, if not a full-time job. And the morale issues, um, now there's some companies who have scaled and done big with this. Uh, WordPress has been able to maintain it, or Automatic I think is the, the parent company name. Um, uh, the company behind Basecamp has, has done a good job of this. Um, but the trend actually is the biggest employers are bringing people who are remote back in house. IBM, um, there's a couple others I was reading about where they, they basically look at it and go, quality of life for these people isn't any better. We're seeing a drop in productivity. We're not going to allow people to work remote any longer amongst some of these big companies. So, so this might be a golden era. And I think for, I, I mean, for me and maybe for a lot of you all, the dynamics change if the currency changes, right? All of a sudden, um, you know, if there's a problem with the U.S. dollar, uh, Bali becomes more expensive, right? And I look at it and I go, do I want to stay in Bali? You know, so all we need is a war with North Korea. I'm telling you. I mean, we, it, since, since 2008, there hasn't been, we, we really lived through like this, this uh, nine years of almost uninterrupted uh, expansion and growth. You've had tremendous um, uh, leniency from the Fed in the US, but the European Central Bank as well. Like they just printed money, you know? And you're dealing with like a sugar high. If you look at the stock market, it's at an all time high. If you look at cryptocurrencies, they're at an all time high. Um, and that stuff changes. And all of a sudden, a lot of the kind of the slack in the line that you get as a digital nomad, it becomes yanked, it becomes tighter, you know? So, not to be a Debbie Downer. So enjoy it. I think, I think it's, I think it's like a golden, I think it's like, I think it's a gold, I think it's a golden period. I think it's a golden period. I think, you know, 20, 30 years from now, um, who knows, maybe people look back and be like, that was such a unique, uh, period of time for, for you all, you know? I'm curious how many people think that versus that we're all going to work like this. So for kind everyone. of on the other side of like, most things you said I'm kind of like on the other, and like with this too, I'm kind of that it's not so away. Like it's normal that they let people up and the productivity drops and they try to pull back. But it just seems like just a bunch of people who do it. Well, you, I think what you will see is that the top 1% continue to make demands and get away with it, but that you have a hollowing out of that top 1% or 10% is able to do it, and the 90% are not either not capable of it or they're not permitted to do it. I would argue the top 1% will develop the tools and make it a lot easier for the next 20% to get in, and then they won't do the go to the beach with the thing, but they might want to live with their family somewhere for three months if they want to visit friends. So maybe not the same construct, but I, I kind of really believe that it will like, get a lot easier as the top one person kind of figures it out, because mm. it's like weird mm. as like evolution or whatever. And then I, mm. I, would, I would say more people will get into it as it becomes easier. Mm. But who, let me, uh, it, do you think it's, I think it's hard now, it's management. Yeah, but it's management like, of yourself not, more than anything else. This is so new. Like, yep. yeah, this is so new for everyone. I mean, like on, on a big scale. This is new even like for like a 50 year old person. This is kind of like, mm -hmm. what is this? And mm -hmm. then it's normal to have. But still, I would argue it's not really that bad. And to, we just started, so it's just going to get like a whole bunch better. <laughs> That's how I see it. At least. 
I hope so. We'll see, I guess. <laughs> I hope so. No, I mean, I, I think, I mean, selfishly, if I had more friends uh, um, that yeah. were out and nomadic and whatnot, um, yeah, it would I would be like, lot. awesome. I'd be yeah. like, this is, so, this like, is, you, you know. Ten more apps and five more locations where you can just meet more people and then that would take a big chunk out of every other day. Mm -hmm. And productivity of stuff just starts running up. Well, you're seeing that happen. I mean, you see, you see these hot, sort of like curated co-working spaces now. Yeah, but it's still like I was. I started like a year ago. I yeah. was expecting way more stuff than there is. I'm like, why is everyone sleeping? I like, guess you see, like there is some stuff, but there's not a lot. Okay. Like it's kind of advertised like one more fancy, and like, well, but then yeah, you get there and you have all the problems you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like the framework is not there. Like. I think there are not many these people don't get this kind of lifestyles and then there is demand maybe, but the offer has not catch up in many ways. Uh, for example, the case of Airbnb is one example. Uh, right now Airbnb is super expensive to do the housing and those nomads will be for a month in one place or two weeks in a place they need to. In my case, for example, uh, I need to look in Facebook groups, which is really annoying because it takes a lot of time for betting, for you know, for finding a good place, and to the person, the payment, all that stuff. Because Airbnb is too expensive for long term to rent in most cases. Yep. So I think there is still the same happens with the you know, community building for nomads. Yep. Uh, how to meet other people. Like right now there are apps for like the meeting, you know, romantic partners in, yep. the, in the nomad community. So I think right now we are still like pretty young, this community is still pretty young and there is still a lot of room for growth from the offer side, from the from the business side. Hmm. So I think VCs are starting to understand how this whole thing works, so slowly we are trying, starting to see more, more events, more, more new offers for us, specifically for us. Well, let, how many people in the room think that they will be, they would call themselves a digital nomad in three years' time? Three years from now, do you see yourself as a digital nomad? I think some people don't so, like whoa, 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 we had, we had three people raise their hands out of a group of 20, 20, I don't know, 20 people in the room? Um, there's not 20. I'm overestimating, but I think it's the time some kinds of people don't like it. Like, I don't know why it's kind of like the love character, or the kind of stuff that people, you know, yeah, like, but regardless of the term, like, for us, yeah, but uh, I mean, maybe the, the, the term is not the best, but like people want the lifestyle, not necessarily the, the, the term, just I don't know, you know. What's wrong with expat? Like, to me, I'm like, just. What because do you I mean though? Like, what do you mean? Like, what's, it doesn't what's represent your what you do as a, maybe like expat is something you are, but not something you do. So sometimes when you are an expat, it's like, okay, you, you can be just someone who lives, you know, you work for a company, say that you used to work for a bank, right? In, mm -hmm. in the United States. And they say, hey, there is this opportunity in Asia. You need to go to Shanghai and live there. You go there, be an expat. But you are just like a regular business person in a way. Whereas us are more like live a different lifestyle altogether. Fair so enough. We have a whole a completely different set of, of uh, problems and needs uh, that may not, maybe we are still expats, yes, but it doesn't represent all, all of our, our other problems and needs. That's a good point. It's a good point, yeah. But yeah, it's may, may, maybe too broad in a way. But is your question who in the room will think they will travel and work in three years, or is it the term related, yeah. like digital? Because I kind of like an answer for the travel and work, like I don't know, yeah. like tags or whatever. Yeah. I don't really care mm -hmm. about that, but I won't probably stop it. Yeah. Here. I mean, we probably, we, I think, yeah, we, we, we need to define digital nomad as like, is it someone who spends three months out of the year abroad yeah. in one place? Is it somebody who spends three weeks moving, you know, three weeks here, three weeks here, three, I don't know, like does like a, a summertime trip? I mean, it's in general. A lot of folks call themselves digital nomads. It's a bit like calling yourself an entrepreneur, and then yeah. you need to get to know them and find out what does it actually mean for you as a digital nomad, like, or what does it mean as you as, as you as an entrepreneur, as a UX designer, whatever the topic is. Is that it's um, you got to dig a little bit, right? And and to go back to something I was talking about earlier, which is like the curated co-working space. Um, what you're seeing now is like where you have to apply for some of these places. So there's one that was co-boating, which to me I would hate, but it's, uh, you know, it's 20, it's 20 people on a boat. Like, uh, I, uh, I think it's a catamaran. Um, yeah, you saw this. 
and you have to apply and so theoretically or geeks on a plane or any of these other ones that are like you know you you have to fill out an application you get in there so theoretically the people in the group are at a certain caliber or have been vetted can you get anything done that was the question right if you're on a fly not around on a plane like and you're i mean i can't i hate working on the plane personally but like or if i'm on a boat rocking back and forth i'm like how am i supposed to get anything done you know personally i'm like i want a desk like with a bunch of space and you know i got room for my elbows and i'm not worried about seawater coming in and falling over my computer you know, it's like you try it and what what i have with questions like these what i usually find is i would be home on my perfect desk and just fucking sit there for three hours be like and then i would travel and go somewhere and i would work on the floor on my stomach i wouldn't care i would just like pump out four hours because I'm just so excited to get to the next stuff. And then home, I can have the perfect setting and just be like brain dead. And just like, uh, yeah. But that's the motivation. Kind of the like, motiv- it's yeah. like you're, you're abroad because yeah, you like the like motivation. It takes ergonomics and stuff like that out. Like, sure, I would prefer it. Yeah. But it kind of like sometimes it takes that out of the equation. Like, it sure. doesn't really matter. Like, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, the juice is. As long as you can hold your laptop and it's like not wiggling <laughs> too much, you can type. And then sometimes you get to that state where. Nothing really matters that much. It's just like if you get it done and you're on to the. Because the juice is worth the squeeze. <laughs> yeah. In that case, right? Yeah. That you being on the floor on your belly, cranking away on something, even if it winds up with you got a crick in the back of your neck for the next two days, it doesn't matter because you got to go. I think that comes down to management too. Like if you want to <laughs> stretch, I would argue it might be even healthy to not work at the desk because you kind of get like a bit. You're aware of your pain and you get up, stretch a bit, and you move around, and then your heart rate goes up, and maybe you might live longer. So. <laughs> maybe. Uh, Brian, thank you for the presentation. Sure. Um, I'm an academic, so I'm not a digital nomad, but I have been studying digital nomads uh, for some time. I'm from UNSW in Sydney. Um, you mentioned a couple of things that uh, I wanted to ask you about. I think sure. one is what you also said. I think the general narrative in terms of, you know, Overall, socioeconomic development is pro remote work and future of work and digital nomading. And a lot of corporates uh, might have gone overboard, but I think the general trend is to increasingly allow uh, remote work that must not take the form of digital nomading. That could just be, you know, being home with the kids and working remotely. But the overall trend I would see differently. Also, you're certainly right in terms of, you know, we live in an age of, you know, uh, uh, resource spending and stock market inflation that we haven't seen before and it's probably not sustainable yeah. also just in terms of you know spending all the kerosene flying around the world and other, you know other factors that are obviously not going to continue infinitely yeah so i want to ask you about your you know your view on the next five to ten years all things considered of digital nomading and the second thing i wanted to ask is in terms of um you presented the downsides more or less flat Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether there's also a sort of time component to it. Is something like the benefits outweigh the downsides in the beginning, but maybe then on the longer term, maybe when you get older, when you have a more serious business, things like fatigue, maybe you start to have family, maybe you have a proper business and want to build a network. Do the, you know, is is there a development over time where maybe the benefits outweigh the drawbacks for some time, but then it in a sense flips? Yeah. What do you think then? Yeah, I think you have, um, to the second question, I think you have escape velocity for a certain period of time. Like if you're a race car, you're out in front of the pack. Um, and from a skill development standpoint or a network standpoint that I tend to think that like other people catch up with you. Um, I tend to think that other people catch up with you. And I think that a lot of times you can get escape velocity or you can get that, that race car phenomenon for maybe a year or two, um, but I, one, of the, one of the solutions, and you know, I I came back to Bali at the beginning of April. But one of my solutions is I go to conferences. I go to like conferences in my industry, and I go there because um, it's a high concentration of of talent, um, and it's also a chance to learn what I don't know and pick it up through osmosis. And so, um, you know, in my schedule or my ideal year the first quarter of the year is in um is in the states or it's in north america because it's it's the conference season right 
and and I think that you need that brain rub um, in order to be able to at least keep your car at pace level. I think being abroad for 12 months out of the year, even if you were in Bali, but you need to go to Singapore or Hong Kong and get involved in um, some stuff that I would call like, you need to get back in the matrix every once in a while, right? Like it's, I mean, you just need it. Like intellectually you need it. I think it's stimulating um, and you got to find out what's going on, you know? So I, the, you can get a lot of that stuff. I mean, I watch a ton of stuff on YouTube through certain thought leaders that I follow and you get some of that, but um, you'd be amazed. I'm constantly amazed. I'm like, I don't want to spend X thousands of dollars for a conference and staying somewhere in San Francisco. And, but then I go and you wind up just bumping up against people that it's just impossible to do digitally. And I think that that gets underestimated. And I think it's a cost that gets built into making it long-term sustainable. You just need to, you have to basically allocate that budget to get face to face with the people in your industry or your team or, you know, whatever it is on a regular basis. Sorry. Oh, just that sounded like making a point for being static versus you are moving towards, or do you mean that these people live like static in the States and then if you would be there, you could I'm not sure I got the point. I mean that like so when I go to San Francisco, I used to live in San Francisco. Like travel and then stay there for a while. And yeah, I mean I use I use S SF as an example. So um, I I lived there for for a period of time, and the ecosystem. Uh, Caller Smart is a software development company for apps, right? So the ecosystem that has developed in Soma, which is right around where the Caltrain station is, is world class. It's unreplaceable, right, in my opinion. So to go to San Francisco for a week, even if it means spending $300 a night, um, even if it means, you know, expensive flights, food, X, Y, Z, like it's a, it's a natural cost, yeah. And to get inside of that ecosystem for a week and be able to walk from meeting to meeting, have, be introduced to somebody, um, I just, I think it's irreplaceable. Yeah, I totally agree. I was just curious about your uh, maybe main argument. Like, would you advocate living there more often or like both? I think I would advocate that you just need to, that you need to, that you need to plan on being there um, at least once a year or that you need to plan on attending certain conferences. Like, I think there's just, it's how you stay fresh. Yeah. What time is that? I don't feel like I've been talking forever. What time we got? Okay. Parting shots. <clears throat> what feedback would you give me as a presenter? <laughs> I mean, part of the reason I'm doing this is to practice presenting, right? Not just because I like standing up talking about myself. Poised, steady, calm, but a little quiet. Okay. Thanks. I really love the way you present. I love that you present properly. And uh, you know what you're talking about. And uh, it gives us the feeling of, uh, you know, you know your topic and we also want to work with you because we see that you know that. But I would maybe a little bit improve your presentation because it's uh, a little bit too many words. So when you, when you make the presentation, you don't need to put the full sentence. You just mm. need to put, you know, like, two or three main words of a sentence and then you're anyways you're going to explain it but other than that it's really good cool thanks there is the general rule uh how to make presentations but i don't always follow it it's like six and six so you know six lines six, six rules then it makes you you know just type a little bigger than people are more involved in that just get to the attention but generally it's really important Thanks. And guys, I would also like to make the announcement. We're sorry. Go for it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we are <laughs> <laughs> so we are organizing a camp, uh, camping this weekend. Uh, it is going to be in the Buyan Lake, right? Buyan Lake. Okay. And uh, it is going to be camping and 